Hang on, folks. We're now live on YouTube. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do next, I'm going to grab this URL and bring it into Alpha Geek Radio. And we're live on Alpha Geek Radio. Audio is live. Video is going. All right. All right. You guys ready? Sure. Sure. Rock this shit. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Biz niches. <laughs> All right. Turning mine down and starting the intro. Here we go. Stand by. You are listening to Alpha Geek Radio. The following is a production of Galactic Netcasts. Do you see what I see? Fire in the sky. It is Thursday, April 28th, 2016. Welcome to the Alien Invasion number 182, a production of Galactic Netcasts. After 182 episodes, we have a brand new theme, Brad and Anessa. How are you guys doing? Er, my gird. Excellent. Where do we get the theme from? Uh, that came from Monkey Warhol. He is a listener of the podcast, and he's an electric musician from Minneapolis, and uh the, the name of the song is Alien Syndrome, and you can get it at uh, SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash monkeywarhol slash alien dash syndrome. But we'll put the link in the show notes, and uh, you'll just have to click on it. And wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. You'll be jamming to that or, sir. day and night. <laughs> All oh, right. I, I love that name, Monkey Warhol. Monkey Warhol. It's one of those juxtaposition things. Yes. So how how are the two of you? Not too bad. Too a little hard. tired. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? Quite the exciting day yesterday. What happened? We went frisbee golfing. Ooh! <laughs> who won? I think Brad won because he didn't drown. <laughs> didn't drown. You know, it, it turns out that when you go frisbee golfing, if there is a river nearby or a stream or a creek, you don't need to go into it. And I, having never frisbee golfed before, didn't know that this was a, a an optional thing that one could or could not uh, partake in. <laughs> so you went in? <laughs> Only halfway. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> so I, on the previous hole whatever you want to call it for frisbee golf uh i i i put one of her frisbees in the creek and it was unretrievable because we couldn't even see where it had gone to so on the next hole i i threw and i've like been kind of shanking to the left as it were to use a golf term and the the stream creek whatever was off to the right and of course i would throw it and i would shank to the right and it rolled into the to the edge and there were some saplings that were kind of bent and just kind of like a, a 90 degree angle and like touching the top of the water and another a 90 degree bend up i don't know what was going on there but uh the tree was into it and the disc was kind of sitting on that little elbow oh. and it was like a sheer like, well, you know, maybe uh, a two foot, maybe a foot and a half uh, drop, and it was all sand. So I kind of figure out foot placement, and I, I found a stick that had a little bit of a hook to it, and I tried to just hook the edge of the, the Frisbee and pull it out, and of course the stick broke. Uh, it, was, it was old and dry, so that happened. Uh, and... The, the the frisbee sort of fell back where it was before so i'm like well i could kind of put my foot here and i think i can reach down and, and get it and uh that was uh well i did get it i mean there there is a an upside to this story i did get the frisbee i did retrieve it uh unfortunately i went in and um you know 
denim is an incredible material that soaks in a lot of water. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I had very heavy pants uh, that were covered in, in water and uh, sand and dirt. Um, uh, yeah, so it was it was an adventure. It was an adventure. Yeah. yeah. And people yeah, we, formed a, a human chain and helped him out because the little embankment was kind of steep and was, very yeah. sandy. So there wasn't any way to get like good footing to climb out. Yeah. And there wasn't really anything that would be trustworthy to grab onto. <laughs> <laughs> so the two foot or foot and a half lip that I was talking about was to the top of the water. The water was actually about three and a half feet deep there. So that was like, uh, you know, pretty much a five and a half foot climb on sand to try to get out of. So and I could totally explain the reason for the shape of the tree, but that's for another time. That's that's very true. The important thing is, Brad, you survived. I, I did. I he did. I live to to podcast another day. Let's let's do this thing then. In the news. All right, I'm going to start this week. Uh, Rutger Hauer stars in new Alien audio drama. You guys, we talked about this, I think, maybe on the last episode, that it was uh, Alien Day, or it was going to be Alien Day this week, and it was Alien Day this week. I think on, well, today's the 28th, right? Mm-hmm. So it was, it was Tuesday, and that's uh, it's Alien Day because it's uh, on the first movie. It was LV-426, and that's April 26th. So there's all this crazy alien stuff that was released. Uh, there was some um, cool art, I think, was released. Um, and there's some other neat little uh, alien-related stuff, including this uh, brand-new audio drama and um, dubbed Alien Out of the Shadows. The audio drama is based on Tim Libbins' 2014 novel of the same name, which is actually set within the alien canon. So it's official. It's official canon. Uh, the story takes place between the events of Alien and Aliens and follows a uh, mining engineer who has to take on Aliens and a rogue AI played by Hauer. Uh, <laughs> of course, like I said, it was uh, tied into uh, Alien Day on April 26th. It's the first year, I believe, that this is uh, the Alien Day took place. Um, working on such a famous franchise with a ch was a challenge, but an amazing one to have, Hauer said in a statement via The Verge. It was fascinating to focus on just how powerful the voice can be for such a unique non-human character like Ash. So he was playing Ash, turns out. Um, in the art form I work in, creating compelling audio drama is the ultimate illusion. <laughs> Uh, the audio drama is available now on Audible, and if you're a fan of the Alien franchise, it's well worth uh, to get it. So uh, you can check it out. We actually have a audio sample, a sample of the audio from the audio drama in the link that we will provide in the show notes to this podcast. So uh, would you guys be willing to uh, pay some money to uh, check out this audio drama story, Rudger Hauer? I, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued and I'm kind of looking at, at where to actually, yeah, I found the, found the sample and I'm trying to find where you'd actually get the whole thing. Can I interject real quick here? It sounds like you're a little bit off your mic. Am right. I? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Something <clears throat> like uh, across the room. Yeah, I sorry. He turned his head. I, I turned my head. So I, I forgot to shift my body over to the right so I would still stay on mic. Very uni unidirectional. Is it unidirectional? Just one? It's, it's cardioid. So oh. it's, it, yeah, it's uni unidirectional cardioid. Okay. So uh, as you were saying, what were you saying? Uh, I was saying I was looking for a way to actually to actually purchase this because that would be cool. You know, uh, maybe I'll try to um, open this up and play just a bit of sample if my computer actually behaves. And it looks like it is. 
It's early in the evening. <laughs> Wait a couple hours and I won't be able to do this. There we go. I, I had to, you have to go to the actual Verge article that this is taken from to get the link to get you to Audible. The, or uh, you could go to audible.com and type in Alien Out of the Shadows and uh, it comes right up. A good web designer would not do that to somebody. They would yeah. have it available. Yeah. I don't it's, trust web designers. It's all about the user experience there. So, Blaster, <laughs> fix your shit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Brad? <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah. This is not. This I is know. Not I know. Terror or the else nerds. I know. I have. Now I have to write down when you said that. That was I, around 10, 10 minutes in. Yep. Brad That's said, yeah. what he said. <laughs> so hey, it's twenty seven dollars and sixteen cents on Audible. If wow. you get a uh, thirty day trial free membership, you could get it for free. I used to have Audible. I used to have an Audible account. Don't anymore. Yeah, I same here. I don't think I ever actually had like the subscription, but kind of the cool thing that Amazon does with Kindle books now is depending on the book, you can add the audio version through Audible for like two, three dollars more. Oh, nice. And it's kind of nice if you're going on a trip and you're driving, you're like, I'm going to listen to the book for a while and then you pick it up on your Kindle and it just kind of picks up where you leave off. And so, I don't know. Sometimes I will, depending on the book. You guys want to hear just a, sh a short clip? Sure. Okay, Absolutely. Progress update to Wayland. Okay, hang on. Then Yutani Corporation, Science Officer Ash reporting. <laughs> My mission is compromised. My game is at stalemate. I'm in check. The game is almost over, but I refuse to resign. Not while Ripley, my queen, still lives. Wow. He actually kind of does sound like Ash a little bit. Yeah, he does. He's, you know, he's a heck of an actor. I, I, I've enjoyed, uh, you know, like Blind Fury is one of my <laughs> guilty pleasure films. Blind I really, Fury. Yeah. I love movie titles. That almost, um, I don't know how to describe it, those type of, of movie titles. Well, uh, it, the story of that is he's, if I recall correctly, it's been a few years since I've watched it. He was a, he was in the military and he was blinded a, in Vietnam and he was going to die. He was in the middle of the jungle and he happened upon a, uh, an older, uh, an older gentleman who taught him martial arts. Oh, was it stick? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, stick and sword. Uh, well, he actually, if I recall correctly, he used his katana as a walking stick, or he had a walking stick katana kind of a thing. Ah, it's been a while, but uh, yeah, he kicked some serious butt. And, so it wasn't uh, stick from the Marvel universe. No, it was not stick from the Marvel universe. Okay. All right. Because Stick was visually impaired. Oh, so the, the guy the training universe. wasn't. Correct. Okay. That's a distinct difference. A very distinct difference. All right. So if you want to celebrate Alien Day, go check out. Um, it's called Alien Out of the Shadows, an audio production on audible.com. Hey, you can follow us on Twitter, join our Facebook group, or like us on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, follow us on all the major social networks. And if you uh, are, are uh, if you would rather, instead of searching for us on those individual social networks, we have the direct link to them on our main website. It's gncasts.com. That's gncasts.com. And uh, please, we would love to uh, have a few more followers on. Um, the the uh, the social media platforms of choice. All right, Anessa, what do you got for us? I have a story. story. Well, it's, it's it's nothing that lately I've been kind of doing more historical pieces. This one's more what the butt. <laughs> okay. I don't know how else to describe it without using bad words. 
So anyway, so now Venus adds to the list of planets that has colonized life like Earth as alien hunters have claimed that the planet has huge sprawling cities for its inhabitants. I'm calling shenanigans. What? What? There's uh, there's life in the solar system. There's a whole other civilization that we didn't know about. What? On on Venus. On Venus. Venus. So according to the Daily Mail, the recent revelation came after researchers published some images of Venus showing huge cities and infrastructures. They have claimed that the bizarre undefined structures were created by some kind of alien and epitomize the life like Earth. Mundo es conocido, an alien hunter, has explained the findings in Spanish through his 3D perception featured in his video called Amazing Cities in Venus. The video was uploaded on YouTube on the 24th of April, 2016. Since then, it has garnered more than 3.5 million views. By applying the 3D simulations, the alien hunter explains about the evidence of the infrastructure by pointing out to the area on the images appearing like volcanic bumps. Hey, guess what? There's volcanoes on Venus. That's its thing. Surprise. <sighs> Artificial bizarre shapes appear to be cities and seem to have elements that emit light, he said in the video. As he explains the peculiar formations on Venus, he says the structures could be craters on the surface or could be a nexus of alien apartment complexes. It's volcanoes and craters, <laughs> and it's always changing. Magellan, a spacecraft known as the Venus Radar Mapper, captured the bizarre images from Venus. It was launched by NASA on May 4th, 1989, and began orbiting on August 10th, 1990. It weighed around 1,000 kilos. Its role was to measure the planetary gravitational field to study landforms like tectonics, planets' interior, erosion, and deposition, and to map the surface of Venus. On October 13th, 1994, NASA lost its contact with the spacecraft, re reports Fox News. With all, it reveals that 85% of Venus' surface is comprised of volcanoes, which has a tremendously high temperature of 864 degrees. And there's a lot of pressure there, too. So anyway, according to the Inquisitor, some mind-boggling claims by UFO research community say that Martian surface has some colonized artificial alien structures, which includes shopping malls and sky skyscrapers. Yay! Do they? What so, kind of stores do they have at that shopping mall? Oh, Martians are us. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, and I, I found this on a website called AustralianWorkNews.com. Um, so, yeah, I was reading this and I was like, this is crap. I'm sorry. I will check out pictures and see like, hey, what's that formation? What could that be? But really apartment buildings on venus yeah and don't forget the malls they gotta have hot well, the malls are on mars oh. so i guess it would be in in the grand scheme of the solar system i suppose mars would be like high street or um the the shopping area in town where you have like all the little outlets and whatnot so we're doing theme <laughs> well no we're doing theme planets we're doing themed Planet. So apparently Venus houses apartment complexes. Mars would be MOA, Mall of America, or some big mall thing. And then Earth, I I guess would be nature. Yeah. The sure. outdoors. Yeah. Since we're the only one that actually <laughs> have outdoors. <laughs> oh, but no, I was reading this and I just thought like, no, I'm sorry, but no. Well, uh, these kind of stories make for an interesting podcast. That they do. And and people are more than welcome to disagree with me. That's fine. Oh, bring it on. I would love that. Come on. But I, I just... Out there, no. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... Yeah, no. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So. That's, that's, that's a cool story. Thank you, Nessa. You're welcome. You can help Galactic Netcasts in our constant endeavor to take over 
the world of everything, uh, particularly uh, podcasts. And uh, how you can help is by a small monthly recurring donation to our Patreon account, which is uh, our campaign, patreon.com slash galactic netcasts. And for as little as a dollar a month, you can have exclusive access to our Patreon-only Slack chat channel, which is active right now. You could be uh, talking to us right now for that $1 a month donation. For $3 a month, you get a regular newsletter with extra stories related to our podcasts. Of course, uh, we're talking the Galactic Netcasts Network, and that means not just the alien invasion, which thank you guys for listening to, but we've got the Sci-Fi Geeks Club, we've got Podcast of Terror, Adventure Party, uh, the brand new Else Nerds show, which is going to be starting soon, and more. So uh, those newsletters related to all those podcasts and more. $5 gets you an extra podcast uh, available exclusively to our patrons at patreon.com slash galactic netcasts. So please uh, show your support. We'd really, like we super duper, really really appreciate your support because we need to pay for things like uh web hosting audio hosting and more so again patreon.com slash galactic netcast and we thank you again for your support third and final story brad lay it on us all right gonna hit you with some real science here bring it on beyond earth day where will life be discovered first now, we know that this uh, past Friday, April 22nd, is uh, Earth Day, and that's when we honor, of course, living on planet Earth and uh, try to be conscientious and, and, and you know, how to take care of our planet. Now, ThinkGeek.com did a poll of 2,400 readers and asked the question, where will alien life be discovered first? Uh, and now this is within... Uh, this is within our own solar system, so just to be clear. Not surprisingly, Jupiter's moon Europa took the top spot, garnering 47% of the votes. The 1,900-mile-wide satellite harbors a huge ocean of liquid water beneath an icy shell, and scientists think this ocean is in contact with Europa's rocky mantle making possible all sorts of interesting chemical reactions. Now, Mars came in second with 23%, and uh, observations by NASA's Mars rover Curiosity and other spacecraft has shown that at least some parts of the red planet were habitable billions of years ago. Back then, Mars was a relatively warm and wet planet with large expanses of liquid water on the surface. Uh, coming in third is Saturn's huge moon Titan, and that was uh, got 16%. And this moon is the only world in the solar system apart from the Earth known to host stable bodies of liquid on its surface. But Titan's seas and lakes are full of hydrocarbons such as ethane rather than water. Another of Saturn's satellites. Uh, oh, I need Anessa here to help me pronounce this. Enceladus, right? Enceladus, it's got to be it. Uh, came in fourth with 9%. Uh, like Europa, uh, Enceladus harbors a global subsurface ocean beneath an icy shell. It is smaller than the Jovian moon with a diameter, diameter of just 310 miles. Mm, icy shell. Yes. Crazy. It's like the, uh, the ice cream coating, the, <laughs> the, 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 the shell that you can, chocolate shell you can put on your ice cream. 2.5% uh, of people said that Jupiter itself, rather than Europa or another Jovian satellite, <clears throat> would be a promising abode for life. Now, temperatures there are a frosty negative 234 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be negative 145 degrees Celsius for our, what's that? Subtropical. 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 <laughs> Anti-tropical. Uh, uh, to our you know Canadian and, and other friends that uh, measure things in metric. You mean the rest of the world? <laughs> the rest of the well, yes. Okay, fine. <laughs> We're special. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I will continue on. Uh, beneath which swirls a huge ocean of liquid metallic hydrogen. <laughs> so Jupiter life would be very strange and hardy 
Indeed. That's where the metal man come. The metal men come from, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Venus came in sixth uh, with just two percent of the vote. Like Mars, Venus was probably quite habitable in the ancient past, but a runaway greenhouse effect caused the second planet from the sun to get incredibly hot over the eons. Surface temperatures on Venus now hover around 860 degrees Fahrenheit or 460 degrees Celsius. The uh, ThinkGeek survey uh, also asked respondents how, uh, about how prepared they are to live off of their home planet. The vast majority of the respondents were open to the idea. Only 13.5% said Earth is the only place for them. So, uh, yes, this story was from space.com. And uh, I, I trimmed out quite a bit. There was uh, the paragraphs in between each of the things. So uh, do go to uh, the show notes and find the link for the story that we found at space.com, and you can get the rest of the story there. And real quick, uh, if you can't click, if your show notes on whatever podcast player you're playing us on, if you can't get to the show notes, you can always go to our website. It's uh, gncasts.com slash aliens. And you'll see all the posts there and just click on the proper one and uh, all the show notes will be there as well. Uh, did you guys take the, uh, Brad, did you take the survey? Did you? Uh... I did not take the survey. Shame on you. I didn't know the survey was, was there. Survey. I'm just reporting that the survey uh, existed and what, the, uh, what, what they found. Okay, okay, you're, you're being impartial. You're not, you're not going to uh, be part of the story. You're just reporting on it. Exactly. Very That's good what person. we do. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, cool. Let's. Um, we got. Uh, we got a cool, cool ass sighting this week. Please identify the craft you witnessed. A black triangular, three-dimensional shape, huge, just flying, hovering in it. Shaped like almost like between an egg and like a teardrop. Two long cylinder objects flying over me. I can see the objects in there. It appeared to be rotating, and it was on circular to disc shape, and it hovered for maybe about five minutes. I kind of jumped the gun a little bit. I wanted to ask you guys, what? Uh, what object or what place in our solar system do you think will find life first? What would you say in that survey? You know, my money is, it's on Europa. I, I would be following the 47% the of folks that uh, answered that. So yeah, Europa. So, that makes sense. It seems to be trending that way, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It most certainly does. Uh, uh, Nessa, do you feel the same way? I do. Okay. All right. Uh, then done deal. It's it's on Europa. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Make it happen, Europa. So uh, I went down to Kentucky for our sighting this week, and I went back in time to 1973. It's amazing, isn't it? That ability. So it's the Stanford UFO abduction. That's the name of it. On six. Of January 1973, three women driving home from a birthday celebration in central Kentucky had their lives changed forever when a strange glowing craft descended on them from out of the sky. Okay, it gets better. Uh, they could see it was a very large disc-shaped object with a dome on top and a blinking yellow light on the bottom. As the object grew closer, Smith... That's one of the people. I totally took their names out. I'm sorry. But Smith realized that she was no longer in control of the car. <clears throat> the object following uh, the object following them began to emit a bright blue light from its underneath, which filled the car. All three women became, uh, became extremely disoriented. And the last thing they remember is the car being backed into a pasture. Okay. So the next thing the women knew, they were in the car driving towards Liberty. So lost time. What does that mean, Brad Ludwig or Anessa Moyens? Lost time. What does that mean? Abduction. Yes. So all three were suffering from a severe irritation of their exposed skin. It was about after 1 a.m. Over an hour had passed of which the women had no memory. So there is your lost time. 
After the word of the incident was released on local TV stations and the story began to spread, the women were contacted by a representative of the Mutual UFO Network. MUFON. MUFON. <laughs> And over the course of several years, they worked with the women, arranging sessions with a psychologist who placed the women under hypnosis. It was in this state that they were able to recall further details of the encounter. So here we go. Here's the, the interesting details. Each of the women recalled the presence of strange beings who they described as having large eyes that seemed to poke out of a hooded heads rounded at the crown that descended into a sharp pointed chin sounds like your typical gray to me none of the women recalling or recalled the figure having a mouth the women recalled being held under a glowing eye-like light that seemed to be mounted on a armature of some sort the women described being subjected to unusual procedures such as having a warm gel applied to their faces Oh, they got a facial. That was nice of the alien. <laughs> I'm 12. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that. Oh, you were thinking. Okay. Oh, okay. Got it. Well, you had mentioned mounted, and then yeah. later on facial, yes. and I'm sorry. Oh, I said you're so dirty-minded, Anessa. It's who I hang out with. Yeah, Brad. Not just Brad, though. <laughs> he can't get all the blame. I like, so, I like how that went. Brad. <laughs> what? what? I didn't do anything. <sighs> okay, so they um, also were prodded with metal instruments, and they recalled being subjected to devices which put intense pressure on their arms and legs. Strange physical effects lingered for weeks after the abduction. Mona Stanford or Stafford, visited her doctor who confirmed that she was suffering from symptoms consistent of radiation poisoning. The Chevy Nova developed a number of puzzling electrical, electrical problems after the incident. Louise Smith began having trouble with clocks in her life. The minute hand of the watch she had been wearing that night began to spin wildly around its axis, and her bedroom alarm clock suddenly sparked and stopped working when she touched it. Her pet parakeet, previously friendly, was absolutely terrified of her from that moment on and would shriek whenever she came into the room. The Stanford case is remarkable because it's one of the few UFO cases where the abductee's account is, in some ways, corroborated by other witnesses. Two, teen two teenagers driving in Stanford that night had called in a police report of seeing a strange, bright orange light hovering above Stanford. They chased the object in their car all the way to Danville, where it sped off and they lost track of it. Several neighbors along Highway 78, including the farmer uh, whose field the car was backed into, all recalled seeing a strange light in the sky that evening. So pretty cool case. I'm sorry, you said Danville. It reminded me of Phineas and Ferb. Oh, yeah. They live uh, in Danville. Okay, okay. I've only watched a little bit of Phineas and Ferb. It's but such I, a great cartoon. I, it is, it is. And I, I I need to sit down and watch some more. You do. Every time I watch it, it's not It's like, like not on purpose. It's just by accident. There it is. We end up watching <laughs> Whoops, there's Phineas and Ferb on the TV. How did oh, that happen? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I thought this was a neat case, though, because, I mean, the 1970s was chock full of, like, UFO encounters and abductions. And this one was interesting because of the uh, they were abducted. Three of them were abducted. And there's actually people that saw the thing that supposedly abducted them. So um, right. I thought that was interesting that way. Indeed. All right. For more on this podcast, including show notes, I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. GNCasts.com slash aliens. For other shows from Galactic Netcasts, go to our website, which is gncasts.com. That's gncasts.com. All right, uh, let's get into our picks and warnings this week. These are uh, things that we have watched, listened to, read, so on and so forth, all related to aliens in some way. And it looks like Anessa's first. 
I am. I ended up watching The Martian. Yay! Whoa. From 1968. Oh, not. The, or, sorry, 64. Not the. the... It, it made me think of The Martian just because. Um, well, what I watched is actually titled Robinson Crusoe on Mars. And. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I essentially how I came across it was during trivia, we had a question that had to do with Tomorrowland. And there was a free trial, like one week trial for stars. And stars happen to have Tomorrowland. And I'm like, oh, I can totally find that scene real quick. I have an idea where it's at. So anyway, um, I signed up for the one week trial and this was available to watch as part of the stars trial thing so <clears throat> anyway essentially you have these two astronauts orbiting mars collecting data and they have a little monkey named mona that's part of their experiments and there is this asteroid that comes towards them and they have to move out of the way to avoid a collision, but they end up moving, I guess, too close to Mars and end up getting pulled in by its gravitational pull. And so they have to eject via two different pods, escape pods. And you start with one individual who has, has landed He's checked his pod for supplies. He's trying to figure out where he's at, if there's any life, trying to figure out shelter, all that stuff that you would normally try to figure out. Um, although unlike the Martian, there is no habitat. There's no additional supplies that's been dropped off. And miraculously, you could survive on the Martian atmosphere for about 14 or 15 minutes before you needed to use your oxygen tank, which totally makes no sense. <laughs> and so it, it essentially becomes a story about a guy trying to survive on Mars by himself with his monkey. And he ends up discovering that there is life on Mars. And he... I don't want to give too much away, but there are aliens. <laughs> One of them being from, um, I forget which star, but he's from a star within the constellation of Orion. So, and there's these alien beings that are on Mars that are being used as slaves to mine, like a special kind of rock that's kind of like coal, except it's not black. It looks more like quartz. So, and and the alien is very human-like, and even even in the way of requiring oxygen to breathe, but instead of having like an oxygen tank, he requires like an air pill. He takes an air pill, which lasts for hours. Oh, the you know, old air pill. the old air pill. Let me just pop a pill, and I could totally breathe the Martian atmosphere for. A day or however long it was i don't know it seems like they used that a lot back in the day like the 1950s 1960s in movies and tv like huh how can we work around this obstacle oh i know let's come up with the pill that's like star trek not having the budget for like <laughs> space shuttles or sh the shuttle craft in the first right. so they developed the transporter out of necessity yep <clears throat> it's not as cool as air pills <laughs> I don't know. I, I, transporting matter. That's um, that's way cooler. Transporting than, matter is pretty a pretty big deal. Yeah, that's way cooler than air pills. Let me tell you. So anyway, like I said, there are aliens, not just the um, slave that he encounters, and for for a brief time, it does star Adam West. So Batman is in Robinson Crusoe on Mars. FYI. Nice. Was he was he Adam Westy? Um not in the campy space 
or can't be Batman sort of way. I mean, I, I don't know how to describe it. Because, I mean, it... I, I guess for the most part, he was Adam Westy. Okay. But I'm like, I don't know. He was, but not like as Batman. Oh, okay. He wasn't as over the top as right. he would become. So he was trying to be like a little more serious. And, you know, they did joke around, but it wasn't like horrible puns and stuff. Okay. It was more like sarcasm. But you, can see, more. you can see in the future of Adam West, his Adam Westy. This. <laughs> well, because when did Batman and Robin come out? You mean Batman? Well, Batman, but I mean from the 60s or 70s. It was 60, 66 or 65. Okay, was so it was like right before then, yeah. All right. So he wasn't like over the top. It's kind of like seeing Shatner in uh, the Twilight Zone in that one episode. You could see terror at thirty thousand feet. Yeah, you, you could see the spark of his Shatnerness. It's like there's something on the plane. <laughs> so yeah, um, but anyway, I I don't know if I would call that a big warning. Okay, well we'll we'll, we'll call it a warning because this section is called picks and warnings. Right. I'm like I don't know if I would call it a pick or a warning. I think is it something worse? <laughs> It's in between. It's in between the two. Okay. All right. So let's. Like, I like that, you know, they're trying to be creative with this and how isolation can affect a human mind and then yada, yada, yada. But I also like air pills. I mean, really? Um, but no, I, I guess for the most part, it wasn't terrible. I kind of liked it. I think it would have been better to watch with friends. It's It's one of those movies I seem to keep watching. That like, oh, this would be great to watch with a friend. So you can kind of like poke fun or make comments or whatever. So. Okay, yeah. let's do the review. How many flying saucers? <sighs> I'm, out of I'm thinking out of five. Yeah, two and a half. Okay. Well, that's it's not terrible. I mean, it's not one or a half a flying saucer. <laughs> Could be worse. Yeah. No, I, I'd say two and a half. It's not quite a three, and it's definitely not a four. Okay. So I'd say two and a half. All right, Brad, um, Hangar 10. Hangar 10. Hangar <sighs> 10, man. <laughs> Sorry. So <laughs> Hangar 10, it uh, was, uh, I saw this on Netflix, and it was. Oh, shoot, what year did that come out? Um, it's a found footage film that, of course, I get the error code. It's a found footage film, and it is in color and in black and white, depending on which camera is shooting or if they're using the night vision uh, setting on the uh, particular camera. And it, there we go, I'm pulling it up now. It's not the greatest film in the world. Uh, I'm going to come right out and say that. Uh, this film, it's a film that was, uh, it's a UK film. And it's about 83 minutes long. And it was released in the US in 2014. It takes place in Rendlesham Forest which we've talked about uh, here a, a number of times. And in Rendlesham Forest, the, the story was there's a, a British base and a U.S. base in the forest. And over a period of time, there were numerous reports of UFO activity, uh, high levels of radiation in areas from at the spots where uh, these, these craft uh, were supposed to have, you know, landed or the balls of light or uh, all the activity. There is, there are spots of radiation. Now, this film was actually produced and shot over three years. Um, yeah, small budget and you know, time commitments and, and whatever. It just it took a while for for this film to be to to come out. 
I liked – you can do found footage well uh, to me, and of course it's one of the first ones. Blair Witch scared the ever-loving crap out of me, and uh, I actually enjoyed the film, but I could not sleep the night after, you know, after I saw it. I don't think I'll have a problem sleeping uh, after seeing Hangar 10. <laughs> the, uh, there's a great deal of setup. There's a great deal of... There's, there's a bit of character development, but I, to me, I never really hooked in with the two male characters. It's two men, two men and a woman. Uh, the woman is dating one of the men, and she had dated the other guy and the other guy is he does the camera work and that is uh, Jake. His name is Jake. He's the main camera person. Uh, Gus has gotten Sally into, and this must be a big thing in, in, in the UK because I've, I've seen uh, what's the name of that treasure hunter show that we were watching. It was, but it was a comedy that was based around, You'll have to give me a minute to think. Anyways, it seems to be kind of kind of a thing, uh, and so they're they're looking around for stuff, and uh, Gus kind of tricks them into going into a oh. fenced off area, which is the the very edge of the U.S. base of, in Rendlesham, and they hear strange things at night which are recorded uh, that we do get to experience as the viewer of this found footage. I'm not sure it was done very well. Uh, the ending was very abrupt. There were some things that they were trying to convey which you kind of get but not entirely. Um... There's very much a uh, military versus aliens vibe that you get at certain points of the film. You're left with the, well, I was left with the impression that the U.S. military kind of gave up the base because of the alien activity in the area. But yeah, they're definitely left open for interpretation. Is it worth seeing? Mm, I would give it like... I would give it one and a half to two. Well, I give it two stars out of, or sorry, two flying saucers out of five. It's okay to watch. Uh, it's eighty-three. It's an hour and twenty-three minutes. It, it, it's not overly long. There are interesting bits. the The effects for a kind of a low-budget indie film are actually pretty pretty decent. So uh, I'll give it that. So there you go. The detectorists. Ah, yes, that's right. The Detectorists. That's the name of that uh, TV, the comedy that we were talking about. What was uh, what was your rating again? Two flying saucers out of five. Okay, going low this week. Yeah, I like I said, found footage can be okay. Uh, I have seen other found footage films that I did enjoy, but this seemed to be a little jumbled. I'm not sure that the editing was. Yeah. Editing is the great. best. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to kind of um, tip the scale a little bit on the, uh, on the average this week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out and give my rating right away. Mine is going to be five out of five flying saucers. Oh. For the book Beacon 23. I had uh, mentioned this as my ing on the uh, sci-fi geeks club podcast here on the galactic netcast network about two three weeks ago and i was just getting started uh, i finished it and thought i'd bring it over here because it does involve aliens as well and we had uh hugh howie on the alien or the uh, sci-fi geeks club uh early on he's a great guy he writes some great books in fact i think he's got two of his books um what do they call when they're um, oh, optioned? Optioned by, um, or even probably, maybe even purchased the rights to by by film studios. Uh, but this is really, really good, and I I think this is actually one of them that's been that's been optioned or the rights to have been bought by a film studio. Nice. 
but it's 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 about a former military guy. This is in the future. A former military guy who is the operator of a beacon, which is basically a futuristic version of a lighthouse on the sea. And what they do is it's a way for ships to avoid areas with, for example, in his area, a big asteroid field. Mm. So if they go if they go through on faster than light travel through this area, they basically will their ship will disintegrate because of all these asteroids. Mm. So the beacons are to protect the shipping lanes in space. Um, he is a soldier and he's got issues from from the war and the war is with these aliens so the war keeps getting closer and closer to his area of space which he patrols in this in this beacon and um some weird things happen before the kind of end where it um there's a big ending involving aliens but there's some precursor stuff to that where you kind of suspect there's something more going on than than they than they kind of come out and say that's that's going on. Uh, like there's a his device that kind of protects the area or gives these ships a warning uh, is brought down by he he does trade with people that come by in in their ships. So somehow there was a bug that got into his system that shut down his beacon and thus a um, a cargo ship um, flew through and got destroyed. So there's some weird things going on with that. Eventually, uh, another beacon shows up and turns out there's a girl kind of manning that beacon and they kind of have an affair. They start seeing each other. They start going back and forth between beacons. It's kind of cool. Um, He eventually ends up... um, I don't want to give too much away, but he I'll, I'll say this one last thing. He event, he eventually ends up owning a, like a, a cross between a dog and a cat. It's like an alien uh, pet that's really big and it looks ferocious and it can be ferocious, but actually when it gets to know the people that it's around, it's, it's, um, it's very lovey and uh, it's, it's kind of a cute relationship that he has with that animal. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a really great book. It's it's a fast read. I forget how many pages. Maybe two hundred fifty pages. It's a pretty short book. Um, it's quick read. He he writes it in a way where um, you know some books you kind of get bogged down a little bit. This one is not the case. It's a quick read, and I think that all of you Alien Invasion listeners will enjoy Beacon Twenty Three by Hugh Howey. There's aliens. It's in the future. There's spaceships. It's pretty awesome. So again, five out of five flying saucers. Nice. nice. So that is our picks and warnings. <laughs> uh, we don't have any feedback, but uh, we'd love it from you. You can uh, leave it by emailing aliens at gncasts.com. That's aliens at gncasts.com. You can call our voicemail number, leave a message or a text at 805. That's area code 805-328-3966. Go to our website, GNCasts, that's G-N-C-A-S-T-S dot com slash aliens, and leave a uh, voice message or leave a comment on the episode um, entry on our our website and uh, give us a little feedback, what you thought of the things that we talked about on this episode of the Alien Invasion Podcast. All right, uh, subscribe to us on iTunes, and if you like what you hear, please give us some five four or five stars and a couple sentence reviews uh, that helps us get more listeners. We're also available on Stitcher Smart Radio. We're available on Google Play Music now. Uh, Google Play Music, you just um, it's not on the mobile devices yet. It's not on the apps yet. But, uh, right? Right, Brad? It's still only browser, right? Yes. Okay. But that's coming soon. It, it'll be on the, uh, the Google Play app very, very soon. They're working on that. So... If you're if you're in the Android ecosystem, please subscribe to us on uh, Google Play Music, uh, and we're also I mean we're 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 anywhere you can get podcasts basically, and we've got a whole page devoted to links to where you can find us at gncasts.com. Just click on the subscribe tab. So final thoughts, Brad, you're first. 
Uh, you know, I, I, I sense uh, a good one coming. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> I, I'm I'm now currently looking for an alien crash site on Fallout Four. Ooh, okay, okay. The the Fallout Four story continues. Yes. All right. Yes, it does. Anessa hates me because I play Fallout 4. When will it end? When will the Fallout 4 nightmare end? <laughs> oh, no! It's true. Okay, Anessa, let's, let's wrap it up with your awesome final thought. What do you got? You don't have to pay for Robinson Crusoe on Mars. I did find it on Daily Motion. Ooh. That's so if like, you don't have stars or you're low on cash, you can watch it online for free. The poor man's YouTube daily motion. Yep. All right. Thank you for listening, everybody, to this episode of The Alien Invasion, a production of Galactic Netcast. We'll talk to you guys next time. Okay, bye. Bye. All right. Hang on one second. Let me wrap up this.